Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome, welcome to, um, today, to today's event. Um, you know, the, the title of the event is Race and Class in the Air, Asian and Latina Immigrant Women on Environmental Injustice and Moral Citizenship. I'm Professor Lok Su, faculty in um, Ethnic Studies and also the chair of the Asian American Research Center. On behalf of the Asian American Research Center, I just want to say how thrilled we are to sponsor this um, timely event. Um, I also want to thank our many co-sponsors. They include the Center for Race and Gender, the Latinx Research Center, and the Department of Environmental Science, Policy, and Management here at Berkeley. Before I go further, I want to acknowledge that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huichin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chichenya Ohlone people. The land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the beginning of the, since the founding of the institution in 1868. Consistent with the university values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous sovereignty and our commitment to hold the university more accountable to the needs of American Indians and Indigenous peoples. I also want to alert you that we will be hosting another virtual AARC event tomorrow evening featuring California State Senator Aisha Wahab. The details are on our website and in the chat. So for today, um, the format for today's event is that I will go ahead and introduce Professor Nadia Kim. She will speak for 45 minutes and then we will have a Q&A discussion. If you have questions, and please go ahead and insert them into the Q&A section of the Zoom, of the Zoom platform. Um, and you're, you may be, I think you may want, want to insert them um, throughout the talk if you want to. And I will go ahead and draw on those questions for, um, for our Q&A um, section. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Nadia Kim. Professor of Sociology at Texas A&M University. Her wide ranging research centers on neo-imperialism, um, transnationality, and the intersectionality of race, gender, class, and citizenship. In addition to numerous articles, she is the author of the book, Imperial Citizens, Koreans, and Race from Seoul to LA, which analyzes how immigrants navigate American imperial racism. She is also the co-editor of the book, Disciplinary Futures, Sociology in Conversation with American Ethnic and Indigenous Studies. Today, she is joining us to give a talk on her most recent book, Refusing Death, Immigrant Women and the Fight for Environmental Justice in Los Angeles. Welcome, Professor Kim. Thanks so much, Locke. Thanks uh, everyone at Asian American Research Center at Berkeley and the co-sponsors. I just wanna be mindful of time. So um, I'm just gonna jump right into it, but I, I know it's uh, right before Turkey break. So thanks so much for being here amidst all the madness in the world. I am very cognizant uh, of all the political forces swirling around us. So thank you so much. I'm going to share uh, my talk right now. Let me see here, I don't know. Okay, there's the, the main screen. I just wanted to say uh, quickly that this is excerpted from my book, uh, which some of you know is on the longer side. So there's a lot that I wanna say, but I can't quite say everything and I can't quite properly contextualize everything. So um, please feel free to let me know in the Q and A if you need me to elaborate or uh, further contextualize. Um, I'll also just quickly say that all proceeds from the sale of this book go to the community organizations that I actually studied and I'll be talking about today. Um, and since I can't sell a, a JK Rowling volume of books, <laughs> and I'd love for the checks that are going to them to be a little bit bigger. Um, if you don't mind purchasing the book, even just as a social justice act, you don't have to read a single word. I would be very, very grateful. One of the organizations has already dissolved, uh, People's Core, which I'll be mentioning in just a moment. So, um, 
I will begin with the so what question. Why are these issues important to talk about, okay? And as far as the context for the study and the implications that undergird the so what question is a major point that I don't think we have uh, addressed enough or studied enough, which is that if we are truly to understand systemic structural racism or white supremacy, um, we can't really do that without centering environmental racism. Okay, and uh, similarly, if we want to talk about class inequality, we really can't do that without talking about environmental classism. And one of the ways that this becomes very apparent is through the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, through the work of some scholars and journalists, uh, we've been <clears throat> addressing why is it that it was Black, Latinx, Pacific Islander, and Indigenous communities that were contracting COVID-19 at the highest rates, hospitalized and dying at the highest rates? Well, a major reason is because these are also the same groups that experience the highest levels of environmental hyperpollution and contamination. So lungs and health being compromised, right? Uh, it makes sense, but we often don't put uh, environmental racism at the center of our studies of racism. Okay, similarly, if we're gonna talk about climate justice and the climate catastrophe, we need to be linking it to the environmental justice issues that these communities are bringing to light. The other major reason why um, I felt it was important to study this, standing on the shoulders of, of previous scholars, of course, is the fact that uh, increasingly our neoliberal runaway train, right? Or we could call it neoliberal nativist racial capitalism. And I add the word nativist because uh, we often tend to think about race more anchored um, in a white black binary, but <clears throat> as recent nationalism as it's been called, or, or I like to call nativist racism has made clear that you know there are so many different dimensions uh, to this neoliberal uh, racial capitalism. And if I'm just gonna define it broadly by neoliberal, I'm really stressing the fact that um, since the 1980s uh, and the Reagan era, uh, we've withered the social welfare state. Uh, we basically um, de-emphasized our uh, resources and attention to the public good and uh, allowed the market um, to run away, right? Um, and the communities that are the most afflicted by this sort of neoliberal uh, racial capitalism uh, are communities of color, including immigrants and refugees. And one of the reasons uh, why you're increasingly seeing not just immigrants, but undocumented immigrants, right? Um, undocumented refugee populations, um, organizing at the grassroots level is yes, because of the increased violence uh, and neglect under uh, this neoliberal regime, but it's also because if they're formally excluded, right, uh, from political processes, or they're just um, by custom, you know, excluded from political processes or marginalized within, that grassroots organizing for political gain makes more sense, okay? So this links up to the next point, which is that increasingly you're seeing uh, women of color, immigrant women of color, many of whom are unauthorized, actually leading these um, community grassroots movements, uh, which have become among the most dynamic in our global cities, like LA, San Francisco, New York, et cetera, but not much is known about these movements, okay? <clears throat> and so in relationship to that, I argue that the disciplines of which we are part, sociology, Asian American studies, ethnic studies, and um, you know, interdisciplinary studies of the environment could really center these phenomena more, okay? So uh, <clears throat> one of the other uh, dimensions that we could bring in more because we're involving uh, migrants is issues of citizenship, right? And uh, in addition to that, what my study showed, um, and it, it links up also with uh, the sociology of social movements, is how important emotions and affect were to the environmental justice struggle, both from the top down and the bottom up. So I'm just gonna be providing a slice of that today. Um, but again, I think it's important not to just think of 
uh, emotions and affect at an individualized level or psychological level, but to really think of it um, at a macro level, societal, institutional, systemic level, as well as on the part of groups and individuals from the bottom up. Okay. So just to let you know, my initial research question was, uh, the following. And I write initial because I used a grounded theory approach, which means that I allow the data to help shape the question um, and inform the way that I went about um, studying this phenomena. Okay. I also use extended case study. I don't have a, a lot of time to get into that, but happy to do so in the QA. But originally, my question was you know, in this environmental justice movement, in this port industrial concentration in Los Angeles, how does having unhealthy bodies shape the political lines? And for this talk, I'm, I'm only going to secondarily uh, talk about strategies, but you know, how does it shape kind of the political lines, the political boundaries, the divisions that Asian and mostly Latina immigrant activists are choosing, right? Um, and I, of course, wanted to make sure to link um, the politics of being unhealthy, the politics of dealing with pollution to race and class because as some of you may know, we often attribute environmental injustice to uh, racism, to classism, you know, first and, and foremost. But because many of these activists are actually uh, women and mothers who are attuned to gender, um, and many of them are immigrants, some of whom are unauthorized, I also wanted to make sure to look at citizenship. Um, so gender and citizenship are more going to be linked to sort of bottom up processes of um, movement organizing. OK, and also obviously to look at the intersections. And for this scholarship, I'm drawing on um, <clears throat> women of color, feminist theory, Hooks Hill Collins, um, some from critical race theory, not the right wing kind, uh, not that they know what it is, but <laughs> um, but also kind of drawing on their longstanding research on the way in which racism or um, you know, discrimination against women of color is based on seeing them as more in their bodies, right? And less in their, their minds, more in their feelings, less in their rational um, <clears throat> mental capacity, okay? So I, I'm gonna just briefly tell you about the data and method, um, <clears throat> just to let you know why the break uh, in terms of years is because at those two points, I actually uh, left the field temporarily to give birth to my first and second child. And the reason why I think it's important to note that is because uh, when we do intersectional feminist methodology, we don't, uh, you know, excise the fact that, you know, family life, um, our uh, obligations uh, as women, as parents, et cetera, are separate and have no relationship to our uh, work and our data collection. That's absolutely not true. And it's also because since many of the activists, the majority of the activists were women, uh, one of the reasons why uh, they entrusted me and I was able to gain entree was because I was a fellow mother, okay? So um, it's absolutely crucial. Now, the first method I used um, <clears throat> was about three and a half years of ethnographic participant observation. So that means that I was actually partaking in um, similar to the same activities as the organizers on the ground. Although I tried to not impose myself or um, you know impose my own sort of thoughts or uh, what I thought were best strategies because obviously I wanted to know more about the way um, they thought it was best to organize. But any, everything from meetings to socials um, <clears throat> was what I attended uh, alongside and participated in. The second major method was close to 50 in-depth interviews with the activists. Um, some of them are leaders, some of them are members, some of them are not even part of the community-based organizations, they're just allies, okay, and they're kind of detached, but they're, they're you know, part of the movement. And uh, I want to make clear uh, from the outset that this is not a study of uh, a cross-racial coalition of environmental justice uh, activists. And the main reason for that is because the organizing often happens related to neighborhood. And if any of you know anything about LA, it's very spaced out. It's highly segregated. 
But another major reason is because of language. Uh, you know, these movements don't speak the same language. The largely um, Latina led uh, immigrant movement was Spanish speaking primarily, although there were translation services, but that wasn't always available because that takes a lot of resources and energy. And the, the Filipina, primarily Filipina led movement uh, is English speaking primarily, okay? So um, major differences between uh, the two communities besides language is citizenship, okay? So the brunt of the Mexican American, uh, Mexican immigrant movement was unauthorized. Um, most of the Filipino led Asian American movement was, uh, they were citizens, okay? But not all, but the vast majority. Uh, also the communities that they were focused on, the uh, largely uh, Mexican, but other Latinx communities tended to be working class as well. Uh, the Filipinx uh, led Asian American uh, movement focused more on Carson, which tends to be more middle class or the surrounding LA area, which tends to be more middle class. Of course, there's variation, okay? Um, so uh, People's Corps is the major Asian American organization I worked with, but there's uh, a lot of them have their feet in other organization other organizations uh, like FACES, which is another uh, Filipinx organization there. Um, you'll be hearing me probably talk a lot about um, Long Beach Alliance for Children with Asthma, LABACA, uh, Coalition for a Safe Environment, okay? Um, and just to let you know, Communities for a Better Environment, CBE, that's probably the most renowned. Um, I worked mostly with their Youth Environmental Justice Program, which is a program that probably they're best known for. This organization tended to be more multiracial in staff, uh, but also in terms of the populations they serve, okay? And the last major uh, method I use was documents analysis. So in order to be able to kind of triangulate what people were doing, which is ethnography, with what people were saying, which is interviews, um, I analyzed hundreds and hundreds of pages of everything from agendas to reports um, to see how they articulated in writing. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background, um, basically, uh, LA is the largest urban oil field in the country. Now, most of us don't know this or we haven't heard this because we're used to hearing about Hollywood or we're used to hearing about fashion, right? Kim K, Lakers, whatever, right? But uh, LA is the largest urban oil field in the country. And uh, basically, for any of us to have any product like the laptop or the phone you're staring at or you know the tumbler in front of me it takes oil right we need oil to make everything um and in order for us to be able to receive these goods which are no longer since about the 70s and 80s manufactured in the united states right uh, whence before it was under industrial capitalism and that boom. Now, as you know, most of it is manufactured in China and far flung countries. That means most of the things you and I buy have to be shipped here from very long distances, right? And that goods movement apparatus from ship, such as, you know, in the bottom right corner in the ports, to putting that stuff on trains, top left to uh, 16 wheeler trucks, to the freeways, top right, right? It requires oil. So bottom left, you see a picture of oil refineries that are basically right there. Frontline communities are neighbors with these little mini cities of uh, what I like to call like, you know, these mini city oil refineries. They're so fast and gargantuan. Um, this is Wilmington in the bottom left. So you see oil drills everywhere and drilling, active drilling. So I drive by a, a hospital parking lot. I kid you not, there is an oil drill, drilling oil there. Uh, the irony, right? Uh, you'll see it in the Boys and Girls Club, right in the park, right next to uh, schools. I mean, it's, it's, uh, and, and, and then you see like all the, the waste generated by oil refining. So I could go on and on about that. Um, but all of these goods movement uh, modes of transportation run on diesel. So the big cargo container ships to the trains, they all run on diesel. 
So you have both pollution from oil refineries, which is a myriad number of toxic chemicals, and then you have diesel uh, particulate matter entering the lungs and the bodies of these communities of color. Just to give you a sense of scale, I wanted to show you a picture of the Port of Los Angeles in Long Beach. Uh, you saw a previous picture on the bottom right in the slide. Um, they are gargantuan, okay? Um, I mean, if you think about how big these ships are that are pictured uh, towards the back uh, and all the cargo containers there carrying everything from clothes, cars, furniture, electronics, uh, food, tchotchkes, all the things you and I buy, right? And the Port of LA in Long Beach um, is the biggest in North America, and it's in the top 10 in the entire world, uh, because as you can imagine, China to LA and Long Beach, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but also um, Southern California, LA made a real push to become this kind of um, goods movement, uh, you know, global city, okay? But I just wanna make clear, it's also there in San Francisco, it's also New York, New Jersey, Seattle, Tacoma, Houston. I mean, anywhere that really um, is along the coast and vie to be, um, you know, at the sort of, at the, the cusp of what's going on in terms of economies relying on this goods movement. Um, they have huge ports there, okay? And I apologize for the poor quality of this map, but I think you can see enough that if you go to the bottom, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but you can see where it says the word Long Beach, that's where the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach is. If you go a little bit west, that was a major community I studied, a working class Latinx, largely undocumented community in West Long Beach. Right above that is Wilmington, another similar community with a similar demographics. You go a little above that, you see Carson. This is where most of the Asian uh, immigrant uh, movement was based. And if you just go to the right, you see the 710 freeway, part of the Alameda corridor. So this is the major freeway that uh, the trucks travel on uh, to bring all those goods to the Walmarts, the Best Buys, the car dealerships, um, Target, you name it, right? And it is actually the most cancerous freeway in all the United States. And if you look where it runs through, it runs through all these cities and communities of color, right? Um, that have been displaced, um, that have forced people to move, that have made people sick with asthma, cancer, and premature death. And so when we think of racist monuments, we shouldn't just think of Confederate statues, right? We need to think about freeways as among the most racist monuments uh, in our country. And then if you just kind of circle in this region that I was telling you about, you have lots of rail yards next to these communities, immigrant communities of color, and you have lots of oil refineries, okay? So one of the first things that I noticed when I started um, doing my uh, research um, using the grounded theory extended case study method that they talked a lot about uh, their bodies and their embodiment in relationship to issues of environmental justice or injustice. And so one of the themes that emerged immediately is this kind of sensibility, political sensibility that we're an embodied community. Okay, and I think Johnny here, who was actually uh, a youth leader for Communities for a Better Environment, he himself is undocumented of Guatemalan descent, and um, he kind of encapsulated what a lot of people, what a lot of people echoed very eloquently. And he said to me, "Environmental justice is not an identity, right? People don't see that as an identity, like being Guatemalteco or Chicano. So basically saying we think of identity politics as race, ethnicity, class, gender. We don't think of environmental justice as identity politics. But to me, he says, it is. It has so much to do with where I live, where I grew up in the U.S. That's why I hold EJ dear to my heart. EJ allowed me to do that without having to focus on just one identity. It's that I'm part of my community and my environment and my surroundings, which it's not just pollution. I can't take it, my environment, my community away from me. So again, he's saying, you know, normally I have to kind of, you know, especially in the US context, we just maybe, for example, focus on race or ethnicity, which is why he brought that up. But environmental justice allows me to kind of have a holistic um, sense of a political identity that involves all of these different axes. And even more so it is me because I can't take my community, right? that uh, basically uh, experience a marginalization or hyperpollution along all these axes away from me, 
right? I can't separate it. But I think it's very instructive here too, towards the bottom when he says, but I want to be clear, it's not just pollution. Yes, I embody the pollution of my community and the disproportionate health maladies, but I also embody our resistance, um, our work to help each other out. Uh, you know, there's lots of uh, references to mutual aid, right? And that we fill in where this violent, neglectful system uh, basically allows us to get sick and die premature death, okay? So one of the other important points I wanna make about why they feel so strongly about focusing on their embodiment, right? Is because they um, are acutely aware that the state as well as industry, right? corporate America, under this neoliberal racial capitalist regime or nativist racial capitalist regime, exercises a certain kind of emotive power and violence, okay? And one of the ways that they do that is that if you look at their websites, and I'll give you a, 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 a glimpse in a moment, if you look at their reporting, if you listen to their discourse and rhetoric, they really focus on feigning an ethics of care and concern, right? We really care about the environment. We care about you frontline communities dealing with all these locally unwanted uses. Um, we care about all the sickness, et cetera. We're concerned, right? But what's so important to understand about this is that it, it was the women, it was the mothers that in the environmental justice movement really stressed and promulgated this ethics of care and concern as their politics, right? And so they not just co-opting and copying what came from the bottom up, from especially women of color mothers, right? Marginalized in other ways, but they're also co-opting the movement because they're using it to be able to justify why they, um, you know, are doing the things that they do, right? Um, we care, therefore we're gonna put up uh, you know, monitors, right? Air monitors. We care, so we're going to put up sound walls, right? Um, another major way in which uh, the activists and I myself noticed uh, through ethnography um, that the regulatory state, so this is the government, you know, for example, the air quality management district that's meant to regulate, right? And one of the major hallmarks of neoliberalism, too, is that there's much less regulation or deregulation, right? Um, and by the corporate officials is that they always claim to be fixing the problem and that's linked to their uh, concern and their care, right? But they never acknowledge that they actually created this problem in the first place, right? Oil and gas, the fossil fuel industry, as well as the government wing that doesn't regulate them, right? So in many ways, by fixing, quote unquote, the problem because they care so much, they're basically taking undue credit. So what you'll often see in their reporting in their discourse and in websites is, um, Oil and gas, the corporations, the air quality management districts, i.e. regulators, and these environmental justice communities have all um, basically curbed um, emissions, or we've lowered emissions, or you know decreased uh, asthma rates or asthma triggers. So they kind of lump them all in one group as if they're all equally fighting for justice, okay? And again, I'm drawing on scholars like Robinson, Goldberg, um, for um, these kinds of conceptual frameworks as well. I just want to give you a quick glimpse from uh, a, a statement I took directly from Valero Oil's website about how much they care about us and the earth, and especially these quote-unquote environmental justice communities. Um, they boasted on their site, Valero ranked highest among independent refiners in Newsweek's 2017 green rankings of the top 500 U.S. publicly traded companies for environmental performance, okay? I don't think I have to... Uh, spell it out for this audience why uh, oil and gas at Valero boasting about how green they are as a company is uh, fun, okay, or ironic. <laughs> it's like Coca-Cola boasting about how healthy a company they are, okay? Now, um, what this brought me to is getting into a deeper understanding of how activists in this environmental justice struggle therefore see, define um, racism as well as classism. Um, especially thinking about how much they talked about embodiment or emotions. Um, how do they conceptualize them versus us politically, right? And as immigrants, many of whom are undocumented, um, 
what do they consider citizenship or who do they consider a citizen, okay? And these are all the types of questions that I think um, they help us center in our studies of environmental injustice, environmental justice, okay? So what um, they make clear is that they define community and they use the word community a lot um, as a, a, a body of people that suffer embodied racism and classism, okay? So racism and classism is not just understood as this kind of um, abstract disempowerment, right? Of a dominant race or class over a subordinate race or class, but that there's also issues of unequal embodiment going on here on the basis of race and class, okay? They also talk about them versus us and who's a citizen by saying that we are the ones who practice the real citizenship, okay? You can tell us we're illegals, right? And racialize us as such, right? But we are the ones actually practicing real citizenship. And what they mean by that is if you ask the largely Latinx immigrant uh, activists, they'll say they are the healthy wealthy, okay? They are elites that are privileged and advantaged who think citizenship is going out to vote or you know practicing some legal right, okay? That to us is a disembodied immoral form of citizenship because if they really were practicing real citizenship, they would be taking care of us by not hurting our body, sickening us and causing premature death. Um, and they certainly wouldn't be immoral by saying that they care when they really don't, okay? Now, interestingly, if you talk to the Asian-led environmental justice movement, they focus more on the fact that they're white and we're people of color. Though, you know, race and class do go together, and I'll, I'll be coming back to that at the end. Um, and they'll see it as white America doesn't, you know, have to experience our suffering, right? because of their own kind of race privilege and uh, racial neglect, right? Um, and there's immorality there, right? Um, pretending to care about people of color when they really don't, okay? So that is one dimension, and I know I'm trying to capture a lot in this talk, but they're related, okay? So that is one dimension that I'm gonna show in the following data. But the other question I want to explore is why was it that the largely Filipina-led Asian immigrant EJ movement saw racism as the main cause of their disproportionate contamination and pollution, okay? Why, on the other hand, did the largely Mexican Latina immigrant-led movement saw classism, or you can say environmental classism as the main reason for their disproportionate, uh, you know, uh, unhealthy status and the disproportionate pollution in their community, okay? So first I kind of want to uh, revisit this question of what they meant by my community. Right. And I think this is an example of Lauda, who is a leader at Labaca, um, said that uh, in her own way, that it's the fact that we are uh, poor people, right, embodying this pollution that uh, marks my quote unquote community. OK, so this is early on in my field work and I had heard the word community a lot. So I said, when you say that, do you mean the people who live in this specific area or and Lauda cut me off, said no, not only us immigrants. No, it's low income. I'm not talking about Latinos, Black, or other racial ethnic groups who live here, okay? Now, another major um, lens framework to use for why the largely Latinx immigrants saw class inequality, class injustice, as the main reason for the disproportionate pollution and sickness um, is a transnational understanding, right? A transnational lens. So we kind of zoom out and use a broader lens. And um, I've used transnationalism in all my work in some way, shape, or form. So this wasn't a surprise to me. Um, but you know, it doesn't necessarily even have to be transnationalism in the sense that it's practical that you cross borders, you know, to vote or take care of your your property over there. But it's about what you experienced prior, um, you know, to moving afterwards, and then the interconnections you make, right? Whether it's through your conversations, your imagining your feelings, right? And so um, it became very abundant to me that when I talked to activists like Marta, um, 
you know, when I said, do you think it's, it's because of you guys being Latinos that they are, you know, uh, disproportionately polluting and basically not doing much about it. And she said, it is not just because they are Anglo. So the elites uh, in the US over there in Mexico, we are Mexican. And it's the same thing when there's politics, they don't pay attention to us. To put it simply, they are people who are not in a lower class like us. They separate themselves from us and they don't know the people. They live near the mountains and forget about us. Okay. So when we were in Mexico, they were doing this to us. The rich Mexicans were doing it to the poor Mexicans. They live in their beautiful hillside mountain, you know, mountainous communities, and they forget the lower class like us. Okay. So this is an important point highlighting that class injustice was what they experienced in Mexico. Class injustice is what they're continuing to experience in the United States. Okay. Even if there is some mobility. Um, the other major kind of theme that emerged um, is the fact that because the wealthy are healthy, right, um, that they are privileged to not have to suffer by living in our communities, right, right next to oil refineries, drills, oil storage, uh, freeways, train yards, ports, right, that they're disembodied from that kind of, you know, suffering, that kind of classism. And because of that, they're ignorant, right? They're ignorant, they don't know, and they don't empathize linking to the uh, politics of emotions, the inequality of, of this emotional political battle, right? So I thought Lauda was a good example here. In my interview with her, she repeated that she liked Obama. This was when Obama was running for president. And you know, she said she didn't quite know why, she just liked him. And so I asked her, would you ever focus more on electoral versus grassroots politics, given her budding interest in Obama and the, you know, electoral game? And Lauda said, never, my community is first. It's because the community needs to be educated. We need to include ourselves. And I said, do you feel like Obama or the national level, the representatives, do they know local issues? And she scoffed and she said, um, no, they have no idea because they live in places where they don't know anything about pollution. And you can see her, I mean, she's getting angry and angry as she's talking and she's quite adamant, right? Um, no, grassroots community is where I'm at. This is, this is, they don't know anything about it, okay? I just wanted to give you a picture from the field of uh, these largely immigrant uh, women activists um, who were organizing against the rail yards, the fedeas, right? And they're organizing against them, um, not just because of, for example, the diesel pollution, but because of the land use, right? They're usually located right next to schools, which the women were also active in the school reform movements, okay? And they did this incredible job of bridging uh, their work on school reform with environmental uh, justice. So I don't get to talk about that that much today, but but it's also because they were very acu acutely aware of like the embodied experience uh, and the impact on their emotions, right? There's a lot of noise that comes from uh, these unwanted uh, sites. There's a lot of light pollution, right? That's the bright lights uh, on all day, construct on all night, I mean, construction noise. So there's a very acute sense of impact uh, on embodiment and the inequalities therein, okay? I wanna move now to the largely Asian um, ethnic activists, mostly led by uh, Filipina immigrant um, women, but in Long Beach, of course, uh, there are, um, Cambodian populations, uh, Samoan populations, um, they just weren't the majority, okay? Now, when I talked to uh, the Asian activist movement, they really usually led with our Filipino community, we people of color, we minorities, um, you know, that was what they led with, but, you know, class definitely comes into the conversation. The two are not inextricable. And one of the reasons that this also became apparent to me, and this is quite different from the way that the more class-focused Latinx immigrants organized, is that anytime we had an environmental justice event, anytime there was kind of like a, uh, you know, like a maybe a, a festival or a protest or publicity, the um, largely Asian immigrant movement always made sure to center like Phil and Panay Panoy history and culture. Okay. Um, so uh, let me start, for example, with Larry Itleon, who's on the right, stand next to Cesar Chavez. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Larry Itleon um, 
is actually uh, a labor leader with other famous Manongs like uh, Philip Vera Cruz, who were the ones to convince Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta to actually strike, okay? Cesar Chavez had his reservations about this. So um, in the political and historical um, legacy of the United Farm Workers uh, and the uh, farm worker movement against agribusiness, though, we really don't hear a lot about Larry Itlion, Philip Bert Philip Veracruz, but of course these Filipino activists in Carson and nearby want not just to talk about oil and about asthma and, and that kind of thing. They also want to talk about, you need to understand that Filipinos were basically at the helm of environmental justice organizing because, you know, first of all, no one knows Larry Itlionger. We don't know him in the curriculum as we should. But if we do know him, we see him as a labor leader, right? But he's not just a labor leader. He's an environmental justice leader. So uh, Larry Leong, you know, made sure to organize against the spring of pesticides, DDT, on Mexican and Philippine farm workers. He advocated for organic produce in that same vein. Um, and anytime people are made sick by their working environment, that is an environmental, injust environmental injustice, right? So the two are very much interrelated. And... So it was about celebrating, right? Filipinx, Filipinx American history, culture, our heroes, our sheroes, right? That, that we can't really think about environmental justice without doing that. And at events, they'd make sure to award civic leaders in the Philam community, uh, give students who are Philam awards, uh, who are doing well, uh, honor the veterans, make sure there's a large spread of, you know, Filipino food. So, you know, it's basically about, we can't really understand environmental justice without understanding the Philam community, okay? Now, going back to the transnational lens, like I applied to the Latinx case, um, it was also important to uh, focus on the fact that many of the uh, Filipinx and some of the other uh, activists uh, from Pacific Islander groups, et cetera, they came with a very strong political background, okay? So they were already part of movements, uh, some of them radical. And I know this is a very long quote, and I apologize because my eyes glaze over when I see a lot of text, but I think this is a really important uh, quote from Pia, who's a, a Phil M mother, uh, who's long been active in uh, and around Carson. And she basically says, my political position was mainly in the student movement in the 70s fighting Marcos. I was already active with the women's movement in the Philippines. She was very uh, important uh, for forming Gabriela. Right now, because we live in Carson, California, I'm more interested in the environment because I can feel the impact, right? The oil refineries, the goods movement complex. Another group, the Philippine Network, pulled out of the Philippines when the U.S. military bases weren't there anymore. That was 92. When they pulled out, we felt that it was still necessary to put an environment group because the human rights had gone hand in hand with the environment issue. So you see here, she's like seamlessly weaving between Carson and the Philippines. And I said, are you saying that because the U.S. bases had polluted so much? She said, yeah. And though we were wanting to do just military base issues, we got pulled in because Greenpeace came in and we talked about plastics, that the Global North dumps plastics in the Philippines, batteries, the pesticides, they dump all the tobacco from here over there. So what she's basically saying here is, I can't separate what's going on in Carson from the U.S. neo-colonial colonial regime in the Philippines that is committing environmental racism over there, right? So again, that transnational lens of, of you know, racialized colonialism is informing uh, the Philippinex activists. So I want to pinpoint some other factors, and I'm going to be wrapping up soon, um, why racism was so central to the Phil-Am activists. Um, now, this is an obvious one, which is that most of them were middle class, okay? So when you don't have to suffer as the working class or as low-income peoples, you're not going to necessarily go to class as your main oppression. But I think it's more complicated than that, right? which is that unlike the Latinx immigrants, most of whom didn't speak English, undocumented, the Phil Am and other Asian immigrants had much more frequent and intense engagement of white America, whether it's in their job places, in their neighborhoods, in schools. Um, and as many of you know from the sociological literature, people of color that have more frequent and intense engagement with white America tend to focus on race more and report higher rates of race discrimination and bias, okay? It's also the fact that uh, in comparison to the 
Latinx immigrant movement, the Asian immigrants had a much longer tenure in the US on average. They had much more activist experience, including from the sending country prior. Um, many of the Latinx immigrants became activists once they were here um, and they had uh, stronger English fluency. So they have more engagement with the broader environmental justice movement. They have more access to it, which focuses a lot on how oftentimes even more than class, race is the main determinant of whether your community will be polluted on, okay? Now, this is not to say that um, for the Latinx immigrants, race didn't matter, and for the Asian immigrant activist class didn't matter, not at all, okay? What I'm saying is that when they thought about what was the main dividing line, what was the main source of oppression um, in terms of the disproportionate contamination and sickness, for the Latinx immigrants, it was an issue of the wealthy against the poor. For the Asian immigrants, it was mostly an issue of white America against people of color, but they saw class for Latinx peoples as mediating race and for Asian immigrants, they saw race as mediating class. So here's an example of the Latinx case. So I talked to Celia and I said, you know, why do you think um, they are polluting on your community? Uh, they're not really doing much given all the sickness and premature death. And she says, it can be because they might think that immigrants only come to take from the country uh, instead of giving to the country. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit blocked. Uh, let me read this and not give to the country, okay? Um, and I said, so sometimes do you think it has to do with being Latino or, and Celia said an emphatic yes, right? Similarly, when I talked to um, Cindy, and I'm not sure why this is not showing up. Oh yeah, Cindy. So Cindy's a Samoan American teacher uh, in Carson, uh, seeing a lot of uh, pollution and sickness in her elementary school. She was working with PCOR and she didn't just, you know, um, bemoan the fact that uh, Samoans as people of color, other Pacific Islanders, um, you know, Black, Latinx, et cetera, in this, you know, region of oil and diesel in, in LA uh, were being uh, polluted on and sickened. But she really talked a lot about the way Samoans were seen as, as an SES status, right? So she says, uh, America has false images of Samoans as just being uneducated football players. And she would repeat throughout my time with her in the field, you know, um, there are a lot of PhDs, right, who are Samoan and many of us are highly educated and we're in like professional jobs, but all they see us as are these uneducated football players, okay? So to conclude, I just wanna talk about the implications of my findings, which is that, you know, as a race scholar, I didn't necessarily expect um, for the Latinx uh, EJ immigrant community that I studied to really hone in on class and classism, okay? Um, and one of the things that it made me realize is that I think sometimes as university theorists, right, um, if, if we're not uh, engaging enough with the communities on the ground, we might tend to overemphasize race in a way that might not necessarily be uh, conceptualized similarly or emphasized similarly as street theorists, right, which are the activists on the ground. Uh, you know, and as a race scholar, I'm not saying that race is unimportant. I'm not saying that whatsoever, but you know, we might want to understand what inflects these differences, right? At the same time, I also want to stress uh, through my findings that it became apparent to me that disciplines like sociology, ethnic studies, uh, the environmental justice literature, uh, you know, American studies, we, we really need to be conversing with each other more and doing more inter multidisciplinary and maybe transdisciplinary work. Um, it's really from me kind of um, straddling all these different disciplines that I, I came to my findings and I don't think I could have without that. I also think in general, um, especially the sociology and the environmental justice literature could really focus more on the embodied and the affective dimensions of environmental racism, classism and injustice and the movements to resist. Um, this literature could really focus more on empire, uh, neoliberal racial capitalism, and bring in issues of citizenships, citizenship for immigrants and refugees of all backgrounds, right? Muslim included. And that is related to having a more transnational lens as well, right? Because global projects, uh, you know, foster transnational phenomenon. And so sometimes I think it's easy, especially if we're studying local communities or we're focusing like I did within the United States to be a little bit too methodologically nationalistic. So how can we kind of tap into a more transnationally uh, centered study 
Um, and maybe that doesn't always require having to travel, right, and cross borders and do transnational field work, though I think that's also good. Uh, and I've also done that. But here's an example of a study we could do, right? I had a lot of trouble finding from sociologists anyway, what Mexico's discourse about the poor was in Mexico. But if I was able to link that with discourse in the United States about the poor or discourse in the United States about um, Latinx immigrants who are poor, I do think that also helps us have a better understanding of the transnational sort of imaginings uh, and politics of the immigrants, especially the Latinx uh, in Long Beach uh, and in the South Bay LA area. So I'm gonna conclude there. I'll leave it on a picture of uh, some of the Latina immigrant activists I worked with in West Long Beach, uh, but I'm happy to take questions or clarify anything for folks. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Nadia, for that very um, thorough and um, you know very just detailed work in terms of the connections that you're making, the the comparative lens that you bring, the transnational lens that you're bringing, um, you know, to the study. Um, you know, just incredibly insightful. Um, there are a couple of questions um, on uh, in the Q and A, but I just want to start us off actually with some broader questions. Um, there are two things that kind of, you know, bubbled up for me as I'm listening to you talk. One is um, these movements are incredibly place-based. Yes. Um, and I'm, you know, and geography matters, right? And, um, and, and in shaping the geography, the history of the geographies matter. Yes. And it made me think about what are the existing, the historical, um, sort of organizing work that has taken place in those um, communities, in those geographies and places that yeah. might have also shaped the kinds of um, interpretations, engagements, and even strategies, you know, that they, that these um, particular groups are, are, are taking up now. Yeah. And, and that's, that is such a good question. And I will say, I think some of it is definitely influenced by that legacy, probably indirectly in a lot of ways, because the, especially for the Latinx movement, some of it is based on what the women and mothers want. Some of it's based on kind of the second, third gen, like Mexican Americans um, who like focus on lawsuits, lawsuits, lawsuits. Some of it is led by the community-based organizations and kind of the way they also influence this. Though the women and mothers and the residents have a lot of pull, right? Because without them, these orgs, nonprofits, they really don't exist, right? But, you know, the other reason I'll bring that up uh, for the Latinx immigrant movement in particular is because many of them came in the 80s and they were not political until they got here and their kids started getting asthma at age one, right? Age two. And that wasn't happening in Mexico, right? All of a sudden that's happening here. And, you know, they're starting to think, is this like a natural phenomenon? Well, maybe it is because all these people around us are having it. Maybe it's a US thing, right? But then Long Beach for Alliance with Children with Asthma, Communities Partners Council, Coalition for a Safe Environment, East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice. They come in, they're like, no, this is by design, right? It doesn't have to be this way, right? And so then they become politicized, right? But for those leaders, right? Some of them leaders in some of those existing movements. I would say like, for example, coalition and East Yards, Communities for a Better Environment. They are influenced by that legacy of, for example, the um, racism around the freeways. I mentioned at the very beginning, the freeways are among, among the most racist monuments in the country, right? And so a lot of the environmental justice movements in LA were fighting against the placement of those freeways, mostly through communities of color, right? Completely splitting, displacing communities of color, right? Um, eradicating their cherished institutions, schools, hospitals, daycare centers, et cetera, senior centers, and um, doing so, so that you could either have more privileged communities have better access, right? To certain parts of LA, and or you have, you know, also the rise of goods movement, especially in the 90s, the early 2000s, right? And I would say that most of the Latinx immigrant women probably become active um, in early 2000s around this, you know, mid 
uh, 2010 period. Okay. So um, interestingly, that, that fight, right, basically focuses on how not only was that a form of environmental injustice because of displacement, housing issues, uh, you know, breaking up our communities of color, but now you're introducing all of this uh, pollution, diesel pollution, you're bringing in safety hazards, oil slick, right, construction noise, noise pollution, light pollution, right, so going to the whole embodied experience, right? Then you also have in the 80s, the Mothers of East Los Angeles, which some of you may have heard about. And if not, there's a great book by Mary Pardo called Mexican American Women Activists. And under Duke Major, right, what they wanted to do is they wanted to build in East LA a prison, an incinerator. They wanted to put an oil pipeline and all kinds of other unwanted uses and sites in this East LA community because it's East LA, right? So what ended up happening is that it was mostly the Latinx immigrant women and mothers, just like the case of mine, but I didn't get to really go into it because of lack of time, that noticed the health problems in their children, in their families, among their neighbors, who then say, okay, this is an epidemiological, this is a socio-political issue. This is not natural, right? Um, and we're gonna organize. We don't want, not only do we not want an oil pipeline and an incinerator, we don't want a prison, right? Because all of this land use, right? So it doesn't have to necessarily be that there's even emissions coming out of the prison. There's all kinds of ecological destruction and environmental sort of consequences, right? When you build um, and use the land and resources for purposes like a, you know, a prison. So M ELA, Mila, became very successful and they broke off into other groups uh, because they were able to actually beat back all of it. Now, is that common? Absolutely not. <laughs> you know? So they're an exceptional movement in that regard, right? So there's definitely lore, right? Even if it's not totally known among all the activist mothers of today, it's at least known by the leaders and or by you know some of the CBOs, right? Um, as far as People's Core, People's Core came about um, because of um, a student radical. Um, he actually defected from Marcos, was tortured by Marcos, came here and decided that he wanted to found, found an organization that taught communities to basically find sovereignty, self-determination and empowerment on their own. So that was why environmental justice became one of the major issues that People's Core worked on. And again, it's related to tenants and housing, right? Um, and it's related to all kinds of issues, right? So that also definitely influenced the People's Core side. But I do think that, you know, maybe for the People's Core side, I think that legacy is a little bit more front and center than it is for the Latinx side. Thank you. Thank you for that um, very rich answer. Um, there are a couple, I have, I just have a ton of questions for you, but I, I want to make sure that um, people um, that are listening in are, are getting um, their answers, um, <laughs> their questions answered as well. So let me go ahead and, and read um, Jesse Rivera's um, question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that one of the reasons for racism is that the Latinx um, that are wealthy usually stay in their countries and the majority of the ones that migrate to the U.S. are disenfranchised? For racism and Latin. Yes, that, I mean, I think that's part of it, yeah. Um, and, and one of the things, too, is that all of the Latinx immigrants said that they're mestizo, so none of them claimed indigenous identity or Black or Asian Mexican identity. So, you know, race marginalization or racialized marginalization was not something that they experienced in Mexico. Now, had that been the case, obviously it could be very, very different, right? And again, in looking at some of the comments, I am not at all arguing that uh, Mexican immigrants do not see racism or white supremacy as a major cause of all kinds of, you know, forms of oppression and subordination. Just in the case of this particular pocket in Los Angeles, right, uh, of people focusing on environmental injustice, their emphasis is that this is a war on poor people, 
okay? And that that war on poor people is also mediated by racism, right? But some of these people, not all, are also uh, part of the immigration rights and reform movement, right? And many of them would argue in that context, race and racism, white supremacy is more central than maybe I would see it in the environmental justice struggle. So people can be fluid and complex and multi-layered in the way that they're uh, seeing and, and fighting their politics. Yeah. I mean, I, I think your your previous answer about how, um, you know, it kind of starts with um, the changes in geography, right? Yeah. Kind of yeah. impositions on the on the place and how the disruption of these communities and in, in, in people's lives combined with the experiential embodied um, health yes. issues that were emerging mm -hmm. that really allow them to make the connections, right? I mean, their fights yes. against infrastructure changes, freeways, ports, you know, et cetera, yep. prison systems and et cetera, kind of come together and it becomes sort of the environmental justice um uh, you know, movement, right? That that kind of yeah. emerges from the, the, the joining of those two, um, yeah. recognizing that those are connected issues. Um, yeah, and I think it also depends on when did you get here? What generation are you? Do you come from a political uh, background? For example, Mila focused a lot more on racism, you know, and that's a Latinx, Mexican-led immigrant, women-led movement. You know, I think there's just, there's political variation, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you know, I'm also um, um, before I get to the next question sure, on, sure. on the on the Q and A, there's also um, a couple of things going on in terms of you know for the Mexican American community, they seem to be there's a shadow of citizenship that they're yes. sort of speaking against, right? Yep. Yep. Um, and and um, and that is you know they're again like choosing the language of. Um, this environmental justice um, discourse around um, classism, environmental classism, or being that like, they're the real, they're enacting an embodied citizenship, right? And that's yes. really against um, that discourse of them not being um, legitimate citizens or legitimate yes. um, um, residents, right? Yes. And then for the, for the Filipino situation, I'm wondering, you know, how much does their, um, in, in many ways, that the model minority shadow casting it, it's a shadow discourse that in many ways they're kind of um you know reaffirming the the political activism the history the legacy of the political activism and also the kinds of invisible aspects that are invisibilized you know by that discourse like of Samoans being uneducated for instance I'm yeah. wondering you know, yeah. to what extent are they speaking to these dominant discourses that are imposed yeah. you know on these mm -hmm. groups yeah, it's interesting because in an environmental justice context, they're not model minorities, right? <laughs> and if they, if model minority uh, mythology had so much cachet and political currency, why are they being disproportionately polluted on in Carson and nearby, right? And why are state and corporate officials still not listening to these Asian immigrant women, you know, Asian American women and mothers, right? And so, you know, in many ways, I think that it's context dependent, right? I think that maybe the ways that I sometimes heard it was some of the mothers, uh, you know, the residents that were allied with the movement, they would talk about how education is so important to us Filipinos, right? Um, doing well in school, right? That that's so important. And in many ways, they were saying that to say that that's why it's so important for me, uh, for us, to fuse our organizing for school improvements and school reform with environmental justice, right? Which is that if my kid is constantly sick and coughing at school and can't do PE, right? And there's oil leakages and methane under their campus, right? <laughs> like how are we gonna be able to actually do well in school, focus, graduate? right, go on to college, etc. So I mean, you know, there was some of that there. But I think at the same time, you know, the Latinx mother said the exact same thing. And, you know, there was kind of a shared understanding that, you know, all of us and, and scholars have found this, right, like all groups of color, you ask them surveys, interviews, if school is important to them, they will all say yes, right? It's very important. It's just that the model minority mythology makes it seem like only Asian Americans care about school and doing well in school. That's that is not borne out by the data, right? So, um, but really, I mean, the focus is on the fact that 
model minority, maybe they don't say it directly. And I really didn't hear it, you know, in explicit terms, but really what it does is it, it's a, a form of like erasure, right? It's a form of invisibilizing and it's a form of kind of deracinating, right? The Asian American community. And so in essence, I think one of the reasons why with their environmental justice kind of focus and their strategizing, they made environmental justice an opportunity to also spread awareness, right? About Phil Am people, about our history, about our culture, everything from food to, you know, uh, it Leong and, and our farm worker movement, you know, that it's because they do feel so marginalized. And I think when you're in the political realm, I think Asian immigrants, Americans feel even more politically marginalized, right? So, you know, it, it it's kind of interesting the way in which it's shadowy um, and, and it has its kind of influence without ever having to be front and center. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's a question from Juliet Letany here. And Hi, says, Juliet. Thank you, <laughs> Dr. Kim. In your research, did you come across these social movements and acting any flux or changes, you know, in their identity or communicative mm -hmm. practices as a response to state and industry, industry co-opting, you know, their messages? Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the main sort of forms of pushback, right? Um, I'll, I'll talk about two. The first one is when the corporate officials who have their in-house scientists, so BP, Arco, Valero, whatever, right? Marathon. And also the government regulatory agencies, so the air quality management districts, right? They have their in-house scientists, right? They'll say, well, our scientists, right, show that our emissions are at, you know, normal levels, uh, maybe even down a little bit, right? Rates of cancer um, are within their allowable limits, right? Um, the due diligence is being done, basically, right? What these women and mothers will do, and oftentimes, not always, in partnership with universities. So this is also a real uh, compelling reason why we need to have more university community-based partnerships, right? They'll work with USC and UCLA especially, or certain faculty that are very community engaged. And they'll say, well, our research shows, right, that actually your research is flawed because you do this averaging based on these average air monitors that you put throughout, right? We live, we don't live like that. We live in hot spots. We live in a particular neighborhood or community where if you just single that out, you see elevated levels of contaminants. You see contaminants you don't even mo uh, monitor for, like benzene, right? And so we don't live averages. We live where we live, right? So there's kind of this like, you know, what I, and I brought Foucault into my book, which is like this Foucaultian battle of knowledge production, right? And like whose knowledge is more accurate or authentic or whatnot. And sometimes what they'll do is they say, you don't even embody our community, right? Going back to the embodiment and the embodied inequalities. When's the last time you've been in my community? When's the last time that you live there for years upon years, right? We have, right? So do you know that there's extra, you know, chemicals being dumped at, at the Superfund site, like right next to my kid's school? Here's a picture. Right? And have you counted the trucks when you stand along the 710? I have, and I have my own P-Track monitors, right? And I've done this every day for the last three years, right? So one of the ways they push back is with their own kind of street science and basically elevating their knowledge as a form of legitimate, authentic knowledge because it's embodied, because we live here, because we know the community, right? Um, and there's no way you and your in-house scientists can know any of that you know, uh, disembodied, you don't know anything about the community, right? Do you know about this spill that happened on my street in Wilmington and no uh, officials came out? Do you know how many barrels of oil were spilled? You know, they don't know, right? Another way in which uh, they adjust their, um, their rhetoric and their discourse is when these officials say, we care, we're concerned, right? And then the activists will say, well, if you care so much and if you're so concerned, then why are we having to fight tooth and nail to get not just an environmental impact report, which is the impact on the environment, 
but it, it, a report on health, a health impact report. Why are you fighting us on that, right? Why is it so hard for you to translate it into Spanish? Or if you translate into Spanish, why is it such a shoddy translation, right? That even my elementary school child who's not bilingual can do a better job of, right? Like, why do you only give us a very small window of time to read an environmental impact report the size of many phone books, right? So there's kind of this like um, debunking the whole notion of we care, we care, right? If you care so much, right? Which the oil refiners will show, by the way, by hosting a community carnival for Halloween, painting a big jack-o'-lantern on the on the oil refinery smokestack, right? Giving away free backpacks and pencils with their oil logos on it, right? If you care so much, why are you funding, right? Um, you know, uh, why are you giving funding to schools or police departments, you know, and all that, who then punish us? if we organize against you guys on campus, right? Or we're out in the streets, right? Doing civil disobedience. So, you know, there's all these examples that they give to try to debunk this whole notion of, oh, you care so much. And, and the fact that yes, people are convinced by some of these carnivals and giveaways and, you know, and, and so that, that ethics of care has like a practical dimension to it, right? Um, but, you know, they'll definitely debunk that stuff, right? Quick ones that I'll add is the officials will say, why don't you just move, right? And so the activists, they tear that one apart, as you can imagine, right? Um, the officials will say, you're involved in so many different things. Like, how do you even know, you know, like is environmental justice even something that you really are, you know, that focused on or you know that much about? And, and they'll just rip into those. So those are all the different sort of rhetorical strategies, knowledge strategies that they'll use. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible the kind of multicultural um, response, you know, of yes. <laughs> right. I mean, that's what it is that, that the industry and the state trying to mask. Yes. Um, just pay lip service and really doing kind of multiculturalism, you know. Yes. And we're and rational and you are hysterical, yeah. especially as women, women of color, mothers, right? That whole emotional embodied kind of injustice that plays out. Yeah. And the dismissal of their knowledge. Yes, well. exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, there is a, a question from um, Dr. Alfonso um, Aranda, um, and he's a first generation Chicano um, professor mm -hmm. at CF and a son of farm workers. Mm -hmm. um, great mm -hmm. talk. Have you thought about extending your analysis in other Latinx um, or Asian PAC communities to gauge their respective perceptions of environmental injustice? <laughs> You're trying to keep me busy, huh? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, that is a great question. And absolutely, I would love to. You know, the, the issue is, is, as you probably well know, ethnography, in-depth interviewing, traveling, getting money, analyzing, it takes a long time. So if I could, I would study all these movements, do comparative lenses. I'm in I live in the Houston area now, I, I, and Houston's a port city, I, and I'm starting to learn more about, I just got here, but I'm starting to learn more about the communities of color here, right? Um, and there's different communities of color, right? So you've got Black, Latinx, you've got Vietnamese, you know, you've got all kinds of, there's different demographic features too, so I would love to. It's just that it takes a long time, and so I'm trying to kind of figure out uh, logistically, grant wise, everything else, what to do, but I would love to. And if any of you guys have other studies of similar comparisons and other communities that you would love to share with me, I'd love to see them. There's always stuff new that's coming out, but absolutely. But just to give you a hint, I mean, I, this book, Refusing Death, from start of the research to it actually being published, it actually took 12 years. So I don't recommend it taking that long. And you know, it was after I was already tenured, but, you know, it took a very long time. <laughs> well, that's like you said, you know, ethnography um, requires yes. so much. And um, yeah. meanwhile, you know, life happens, right? Yes. Um, Car accidents, sig alerts. I can't move <laughs> on the freeway. I have to turn around and go back home. I mean, there's so many right children. That's why I brought up the intersectional feminist methodology, all, all the unexpected family stuff. Um, but it was also because, and and I just want to be encouraging to people who sometimes maybe feel like their research is stagnated because 
I did not expect for there to be such an emphasis on the body embodiment and politics of feelings and affect. And when I was doing the research, I wasn't an expert in that. So I also had to spend a lot of time immersing myself in those literatures. Um, and that just takes time and energy, right? But you know, when you're doing a study where you're not just going in, and I don't think for, you know, ethnographic and in, in-depth in research, it really helps to have a hypothesis, go test it and then say if it was met or not, you know, I mean, letting the data kind of emerge and letting the case study kind of, you know, watching the case study make connections to broader institutional systemic forces, right? Like, that does mean that sometimes you have to go back to the drawing board and, read new stuff or reconceptualize the project. And that's also why it took me so much longer. But at the end of the day, you know, I have to be true to what their experiences were, right? So I hope if people are feeling like things are taking way longer or stagnated that, you know, sometimes the light of the tunnel does start flickering. <laughs> Well, we appreciate the work that you do and a careful analysis, um, the you. careful ethnography that you did, you know, um, in your book. Um, there's also another uh, guest, Tierney Powell. Thank you so much for your talk today. I'm wondering about the politics of infrastructure in your research. So mm -hmm. the extractive, energy yes. intensive and carceral infrastructures, forms that community organizers are fighting against, and mm -hmm. also the transnational and local organizing, the collective yeah. systems and infrastructures, um, yeah. grassroots groups that are creating to survive, sustain and flourish? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think the major reason why these communities are even fighting, you know, the goods movement apparatus, right? The oil refining that props it all up and, and you know, is basically motoring it, right? is because what ended up happening is that once we deindustrialized, right, um, in the 70s and 80s, we ended up having to kind of like restructure economically, but also physically, right, like in terms of like the built environment, uh, land use, all of that, to become port cities, right, port complexes, that then requires a whole like infrastructure, freeways, freight yards, um, warehouses. I'm sure you guys remember the supply chain log jam, right? Where everybody was up in arms that can afford middle class and, you know, that goods because we weren't getting our Amazon boxes, right? Nobody was talking about the fact that this was creating elevated levels of pollution and danger in these very communities of these very Asian and Latinx immigrants that I just spoke of, right? Trucks going through like very small residential streets. I mean, just to get consumers their goods, right? And and people are getting sicker, right? And and there was a lot more accidents. And so, you know, the thing is, is that this has become the infrastructure of like the 90s and the 2000s, right? Where it really began. And, you know, um, scholars, uh, geographers are also finding that because then the movements that fight back first are the ones that are located in the inner city, right next to the ports and this whole goods movement oil refining apparatus, then what happens is the kicking the can down the road, which is that they'll move to the inland empire, right? Riverside, San Bernardino, like, or just inland areas, right? Um, and then increasing the pollution, sickness, premature death there. So there is this kind of, um, you know, and then the movements start emerging thereafter, right? But basically what these communities are responding to is the fact that before it was, you know, uh, polluting industry, then it becomes this freeway goods movement, port apparatus, warehousing, you know, danger, you know, from the, the, the trucks, the trains, the diesel, you know, this is what they're having to organize against, right? So this really makes us ask the broader questions. What can we do, right? There's also, as we talked about, the labor movement that's, you know, basically working with the environmental justice movement, right? These uh, companies, trucking companies that are, you know, basically uh, carting all these goods that basically work on a neoliberal um, gig economy type of a, a structure, right? Where you're independent contractors, you're not employees. So you buy your own truck. Oh, you can't afford an electric truck? Too bad, because you have to buy your own truck. 
off of poverty wages, you know, uh, warring against unionization, right? I mean, the list goes on and on. These truck drivers are sick. They're getting cancer, right? So, you know, it, in that sense, this broader sort of systemic issue of what are we going to do? Are we going to consume less? Are we going to um, become green, right? Like in terms of CNG and electric, right? Run on power cables like up, up north. I mean, what are we going to do, right? Um, are we uh, going to completely eliminate fossil fuel, right? Um, I mean, you know, these are. This is the broad kind of questioning that we have to ask, right? Like, are we going to do nimbyism, where we make sure that all of these unwanted sites are in the, you know, communities of color, and or working class immigrant undocumented communities of color? Like, what are we going to do? You know, are we going to make the connection between climate justice, environmental justice, right? Like, so I. I in many ways, I think what is useful about these cases and hopefully people can expand on in their own research, because as you know, this is such a multi-pronged, very complex social justice <laughs> issue, is connecting it back to these broader questions of how are we gonna fight this like neoliberal runaway train where we don't even care, or at least we're not taught enough about to care that these children, these communities of color, they are dying disproportionately and earlier, you know? It is the reason why they're die, they die disproportionately of COVID-19, right? Like, you know, are we gonna get to a point where we literally accept that masking for the health of the entire community or nation is seen as communism and a violation of an individual right? Where is the civic public good? So I just, you know, I think it 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 touches on all these bigger issues, right? So you, you might have already answered this. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think in this, in this, in your answer here. Yeah. Do you think, given your work, you know, with yeah. these communities, do you think the environmental justice, you know, movement can be expansive enough? To, make, to allow us to make the multiplicity of issues that are really entangled, you know, and affecting, negatively affecting these communities. Mm -hmm. But you're talking mm -hmm. about the infrastructure, the class issues, race issues, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. health issues. Yeah. I mean, you can go on and on and on. Do you yes. think that this is, you know, the, the, the environmental justice kind of question can be expansive to oh, absolutely. to allow us to you know engage all those at once. And absolutely, transnational issues, imperialist, environmental racism, colonialism, right? Like, I mean, it affects everything: residential segregation, labor, women, mothers, gender, intersectionality. You know, uh, public health, medical, social, healthcare, environmental health justice. I mean, it literally. You know what I mean? Civil rights. If we want to talk about civil rights, though, you know, I know. You know, I mean, I bring that up, too, because in many ways, as I write in my book, these environmental justice activists have a very complicated relationship to do we engage the state or do we form our own communities based on mutual aid and sovereignty and self-determination in more the Bogsian sense, right? I mean, these are the kinds of political questions, right, that I think many of us are asking and that Gen Z and young folks are forcing us to contend with as well. Do we rely on the state? for rights and resources, you know, um, for political gain? Or have they shown their hand already? And we need to really increasingly detach, maybe use them for what we can use them for, but increasingly detach and focus on self-determination, right? Because at least in terms of fossil fuel and other forms of environmental degradation and extractivism, right? <laughs> I think the government has made it clear what side they're on and that they're aware of the consequences and they're still fine with it. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think we're we're at time, um, you know, for this discussion. 
And um, it's just been so um, incredibly illuminating in terms of your very detailed, careful, and thoughtful research um, in bringing out, you know, the the, the really the entangled issues. You know, um, it's a web of multiple things yeah. touching, and really the 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 robust kind of response from these communities as well. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, Coming from you, that means a lot. Thank you, and thanks also to Max and Deborah. They mentioned that they put some of the links to the organizations in the chat. So if anyone's interested, again, um, proceeds go to these groups. So and just you know teaching about these issues, getting students engaged. I, I just think it makes a huge difference. I do think it encapsulates pretty much everything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Take care.